Hey, this is Tim Pierce. I've been a studio musician in LA for 35 years, and now I have a master class that's online. I still do a lot of sessions, but my, my real love these days is, is doing all this educational content and my YouTube videos. I invited Paul to a recording session uh, a number of years ago, and for some reason he really hadn't spent much time in studios, and it really meant a lot to him. And we went out to dinner afterwards, and then I got a, uh, one of his new signature guitars. At the time, it was brand new. And I actually kind of quoted, I, I, I came up with some quotes, quotes for him that he used at NAMM. And from then on, we've been, we, we almost became friends uh, beyond the actual, um, you know, being an endorsee. We're actually kind of friends, you know, and... Uh, it was all because he, he was, I think he was so, I don't know that anybody had ever invited him into the actual inner sanctum of a recording session before, and he, he really appreciated that. Well, um, I did a video where I compared, uh, from, Norm, uh, from Norm's Rare Guitars is a friend of mine, and he, I took a 1965 Stratocaster from his store that was for sale for, I think, 22000 and I brought it home, and I did a video that you can see on YouTube where I compare it to The Silver Sky. And something happened that I didn't expect. I did, I did snippets where I would play a part on the, the, the vintage Strat and I would play a part on the Silver Sky. And I think I did it three times in a row with different parts. And lo and behold, I couldn't tell the difference in sound. So what that leads me to believe is that they were very, very careful and tenacious and worked very hard to make the guitar a legit Strat. I think because they knew there was going to be a lot of focus on it and a huge spotlight on it when it came out. So it's really great. The, the neck has a really nice shoulder on it, and it's a substantial neck. The thing is, the pickups sound really, really just like, I would assume, John's 64 that he loves, because this 65 sounded identical to it. And if you look at the video, I can't hear the difference. And I honestly didn't expect that. I expected them to both to be good, but I didn't expect them to sound exactly the same. The other thing about this guitar, I'm kind of blown away by the price point. I mean, I get in trouble sometimes for saying that something is inexpensive, but the, the price on this guitar is a lot less than it could be. It really is nicely priced. I might take one of Paul's guitars, uh, not just because I'm sitting here. Tom Anderson has been a friend of mine. I love his guitars, too. Um, I like boutique guitars. I like new guitars. I love the vintage aesthetic, but I like new necks with brand new frets. and. I like I actually like necks that are made by machines. You know, the, I forget what they call the machine that, that makes the neck. CNC machine. I actually like those necks better than handmade necks. And I know that kind of sounds like heresy to a lot of guitar players, but that's one of the reasons. I like necks that are just play like butter and have no issues. That being said, I have, you know, I just got a 62335, but it was refretted with brand new fat frets. And then I put, it didn't have the original pickups. I put some Ron Ellis pickups in it. It sounds great. But for a desert island, I would take a new boutique guitar. So Paul's guitars qualify. They do. Yeah. I used to use an amp called a Nailer Super Overdrive 60. And in the 90s, I had three of these heads. I liked them so much. Had one at home in the home studio, one at Cartage, and one for the trunk of my car. And the guys at J Rocket had an affiliation with Nailer. So a few years ago, when they asked me if I wanted to make a pedal, we came up with this thing where it would have two sections, a four knob overdrive and then a one knob section that was simulating the power section of a nailer. And they did a great job. They're a great company. Honestly, I didn't have that much to do with it other than to tell them what I wanted. They really voiced it well. There's a sweet spot kind of at 12 with the overdrive section. And then the, the big knob in the middle, which is, you know, it's really two pedals in one, the big knob in the middle, which imitates the power section of a nailer, that just sounds great, no matter what. I mean, it's really like a, a kind of a, a, a boost, a very, very clean boost. So it, it, it really is a good pedal. People really like that pedal. I'm, I, I was amazed. They've sold a lot of them over the, over the last few years, and they still make it. They actually gave up on a lot of their big pedals, and I think they, they still are, are selling it. We're still selling it. Good, yep, good, absolutely. excellent. Would you consider that your signature sound, the pedal? They, yeah. They did a good job. Yeah, they did a great job. Put yeah. you in a box. Yeah. Nice. I would say divided by 13 is the amp I use the most. There's one called the RSA 23, which Frederick designed 
with Rusty Anderson from Paul McCartney's band. That, that head I use a lot. Um, the other heads I use a lot are the nailers, you know, uh, and also there's a Vox that I like to use. I have a Matchless Clubman I like to use, an old Bassman. There's a diesel I like to use, and I also have a David Grissom amp from Paul that I really like. Um, a cer for certain sessions, I'll take the Kemper with me, and it's a great solution for just showing up somewhere at a composer's studio where he might not have isolation and just walking in with, in with something. So it's a good tool. I can still hear the fact that it's not a real amp, um, but it's a great tool, and those things just get better and better. So I, I'm a fan of all that stuff, but at my home studio, like I said, it's like starting a car. Everything's set up and ready to go. I use real amps 100% of the time in my home studio because they're, they're just up and running you know, immediately. In the garage, I've built a structure that's basically a vault where the cabin is jet engine loud. It's a 412, and so there are different microphones on the different speakers. I think I have 25s and 30s, mm. Celestians, and yeah, that, that, that's all I need. In the 90s, it was 90% away, 100% away. Uh, in the early 2000s, maybe 80% away, 20% home, and then it started to get 50-50. Now we're here in 2018, it's almost 100% at home. I do go out, but it's just a few times a month. And want? it's local studios in LA, which are all great, but it's just, I have this arsenal at home. People walk in, it's like starting a car. They bring their hard drive, and within five minutes, we're recording. That's the thing, you never know anything in advance. And that's kind of a tradition, but it's also because people don't have time. And it's also because the people you're working with are at a level to where, you know, you, you never know until you're in the moment what's gonna work right. So no, you have no advance notice. There are times if it's really demanding or if it's a film session, sometimes I'll get the song in advance, but it's about 1% of the time. Generally, it's fly by the seat of your pants. You never know. Sometimes I even write the chart. Sometimes people don't even make a chart. They'll just come with the song, and the first thing we do as musicians is a takedown. And we just write, you know, we listen to it once, maybe twice, one and a half times, we write down the chords. So yeah, that's, that's really a tradition. And it's partly because people are so busy. They, they just, nobody takes the time. Well, the thing is, when you show up as a studio musician, you kind of keep the level of, of your work the same no matter what, even if it's something for a friend. So uh, it's very hard to say what my best work is, but you know, I did get to play with some people that I really, really idolized, you know, Phil Collins and uh, Michael Jackson and you know even more recently Rascal Flatts and uh, there's a heavy metal band called Shinedown that I did a lot of guitars for when they were in between guitar players. Um, there's a prog rock band named Toy Matinee that I did. Uh, it's, it's almost easier for people just to look at the website and look at the names that are there. Um, but like I said, as a musician, I, I'm sure you understand this, you kind of do the same level of work, whether it's somebody's demo or whether it's you know somebody really famous. I just was really, really, uh, I got to work with a lot of my heroes over time. You know, even like Glenn Campbell. When I was a little kid, I idolized Glenn Campbell and I ended up doing like three records with him before he died. So I have lots of those instances. Check out PRS Guitars at AmericanMusical.com.